Okay, so we are here with Professor Joseph Siracusa. Now, uh, Joe, today I'm, I'm really, really excited. I mean, firstly, everybody, uh, you know, if you haven't heard Joe on the podcast before, please go back and listen to our previous episodes. Uh, really, really interesting stuff that we've talked about, you know, diplomacy, um, you know, nuclear weapons was an absolutely, you know, intense episode going through the history of nuclear um, in the world. And, and today uh, we're going to be talking with Joe about Australia and the world. And, and I'm actually pretty excited to be talking about this because Recently, I've been feeling as though my understanding of Australian history and Australia's place in the world really isn't uh, where it should be uh, as an Australian. Um, and, uh, you know, I know I have a basic understanding, but, uh, you know, Australia tends to punch above its weight. And, uh, and this is an amazing country and it'd be cool to get a better understanding of things um, and, and, and our kind of place within the global community. Um, and so, you know, Joe, I, based on our previous conversations, I know you're just going to, uh, you know, unload a, a plethora of, uh, a, you know, important information out here. So I'll probably try to jump in along the way and clarify on a few points and go down a few different directions. But when, when you first reached out, you said, why don't we talk about it from 1914 uh, starting around there. So why starting from 1914 um, it, with the modern history of Australia? Okay, two, two things here, Simon. Uh, I have been in Australia since February 2nd, 1973. So got to uh, teach 45 generations of students about security and history and things like that and, and to absorb the Australian perspective as well as my own perspective learned from universities in the United States and, and Europe. So I have a, a good understanding of what people are thinking or what the perception is in this country. Mm. And the other thing is, uh, about 15 years ago, I was invited by a, uh, a dean at an RMIT university to join their global studies program, which had a lot of cultural history, or cultural history and feminism and gender and, and anthropology, et cetera. And he wanted me to provide an introductory course to the degree to uh, anchor these students into history. So I thought to myself, and it's very fun, you know, uh, uh, someone asks you to design a course around a program, which is very popular, which doesn't have much of a sense of historical awareness. So I developed the course uh, which lasted 15 years till I went over to Curtin University. And that is, this course was called Global History, Technology, and Security. And I began for these Australian men and women uh, a course that begins with World War I. Because it seems to me that that is one of the watersheds in Australian history. And what I mean by this is, in the First World War, which witnessed about 20 million deaths around the world, not to mention uh, the 1918, 1919 um, uh, pandemic, which is another story, a story for another day. Australia, out of a population of 4.92 million, lost 59,000 men, 200,000 wounded, out of a population of less than 5 million people. So the First World War would have affected every family in Australia. And it was the beginning of um, sort of the modern national consciousness. Now, I know Australians make a big deal about, uh, uh, about Gallipoli and all these other British uh, disasters, etc. And they, they sort of identify the modern experience. So it seems to me that Australian, the modern Australian experience begins with the First World War and the reaction to it. So you got the small population, which ponies up all these cream of society to fight in the British Empire. Fight whom? Well, Imperial Germany, which had, which had a global mastery uh, um, in their program. You know, they wanted to be leaders of the world, intellectually, militarily, economically, and the like. And uh, uh, the British took them on as great powers in Europe sleepwalk themselves into a war. And uh, Australia got the call to uh, 
uh, to join the British Empire. And Australia in, in 1914 is part and parcel of the British Empire. But what happens in Britain happens in Australia. And uh, Australians served up their, their young men in very, very large numbers and uh, to assist uh, Britain, which was seen as the guarantor of Australia's security and future. Uh, the, the Australians have always relied on what Bob Menzies called a great and powerful friend. They had nowhere else to look except the, the mother country. And so uh, Britain was everything. And while there is a lot of debate among uh, certain groups of Australians about whether they serve overseas or a lot of good Irish here didn't want to fight the British who were fighting the Irish back home. Uh, while there was a great debate about serving overseas, Australians readily accepted this obligation. And in exchange for this ultimate guarantee of their future, all right, Britain is the ultimate, they, uh, Australia uh, made a bargain. And it was uh, an imperial trade off. The premium for this guarantee was Australia would provide men and arms to the British Empire cause. So that would be usually in the form of uh, large numbers of men going off to the Middle East. So the, the trade-off was, we'll provide infantry in exchange for the guarantee, which was guaranteed by the British Navy. So the British Navy was the, uh, the important factor here. And uh, Britain's fight was Australia's fight. And you just imagine 59,000 people dead out of a population of 5 million. When I was a kid and the Vietnam War was, was all over us, we lost 58,000 men in an 11-year period out of a population of about, I don't know, 220 million people. And we thought that was a big deal. Imagine 59,000 out of this small population. So it colored Australia's thinking and it sensitized it to what its security requirements are. And, and Australia's security requirements uh, are determined in the first instance, not only by their colonial origins, but by their geography. That's just something the ancients understood. <laughs> you, you are what you are standing on. I mean, Australia is an island continent with a coastline of 12,500 miles. It's got a land mass of 5 million square miles, about the same as the, United, uh, the mainland of the United States. It's got uh, a, a lot. Most of their people are in cities, you know, despite this uh, Australian uh, love story about the outback. Uh, most Australians are urbanized. They're in cities, about 83%. In fact, one mm. poll years ago said that behind the Belgians, uh, Australians are the most ur second most urbanized people in the world. So there's the myth and there's that. Wow. So in, in a way, and I'm now using an expression used by Daniel Burston, who was a professor at Chicago, who went on to become the chief librarian at the Library of, Co Library of Congress. He says that the land you live in has a giveness to it. It tells you what you must do to survive. So if you're an African nation and you're landlocked, surrounded by seven other nations that want to that want to take you over for your resources or whatever. You got you got a very different problem. Australia's problem is maritime. I mean, the distance from the the the, the coastline of Australia is the distance between Sydney and London via Suez. And you know, even today, Australia has about thirty ships to cover the whole deal, which is not very sufficient. But in those days, the British Navy was considered to be the main. And and what was the enemy? Well, the enemy was. Uh, the, uh, the yellow peril, and it was, uh, I mean, first it was a German peril, and then it was the yellow peril, and, and later on it became another kind of peril. But uh, Australia was always trying to protect itself from the other threat, whether the threat was Imperial Germany and the militarism of the, of the Prussians, or whether later on it was about uh, Imperial Japan, and, and later on Communist China and things like that. It was always to sort of protect it from something. So, I began that course in the First World War, and I suggested that, uh, uh, well, I, I, I read to them about the Australian poets who were over there, and 
and a various uh, minority of views of what was going on. And mm. Australia has served well. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Chicago, I used to look at these history books in high school. They talk about these British losses at Gallipoli and this place and that place. And I thought, God, how big is Britain? Well, every time they use British forces, they were talking about Canadian. Africans, and they were talking about uh, Rhodesians, and they were talking about Australians. I mean, they were talking about uh, the the empire forces, That's how yeah. Britain could use, lose these these large numbers of people. So Australia joined the modern world under a baptism of fire, and they paid a very very heavy price. And they came to rely on Britain in the interwar years uh, as as that security blanket or that insurance policy. I like to sometimes liken it to my students as Linus' security blanket. They came to rely on the British Navy as the great equalizer in Australian international life. Mm. So, would you say that? So, would you say that World War One was essentially uh, sort of like a coming of age for Australia, welcoming Australia onto the global scene as, as more than just a new country, but now they're actually playing the, uh, the global game uh, and lending a hand. Absolutely. Uh, Australia, it was their uh, debut onto the world stage. This is, this is the big story. Uh, Australian armed forces, and they serve well, and most of them on the Western front, of course. Uh, yeah, they were, uh, this was their introduction to, to the modern world and to the uh, the price of, uh, uh, of being part of the, the British Empire. So and I think it it marked a generation of people for a long time. You know, the uh, the, the ordinary soldiers who, who came back, uh, they became part of this silent generation. They, they didn't talk about it. I mean, who could talk about the, what was going on in those trenches and in those no-man lands and things like that? So uh, they... they, they became uh, very important to the uh, cultural growth of the country. You know, the silence was sort of between the lines, and, and, and Australians did another thing, too. They, uh, they, they sort of glorified the experience, you know. When, when you have this loss, when, you know, there ain't nothing left, you know, when a cannon comes through and blows up your platoon, you, you tend to, uh, you, you tend to uh, put all your, your, your energy in memories, so I was always struck by these uh, monuments to the First World War everywhere. I mean, Australians uh, are anti-military in, in, in a sense, but at the same time, it's kind of this glorification. I mean, you imagine, for example, you know, you, you've got Gallipoli, which is Winston Churchill's uh, admiralty disaster. It's just a disaster from beginning to end. And there's enormous loss of life. And, and so what do Australians do? They turn it into a national holiday. This is where, you know, we got part of our, we started feeling more Australian than anything else, you know. And, and every colonial country, you become less colonial and more whatever they are. Uh, so Australian co- colonies became more and more Australian, less less colonial. And, and, and you know, they started to identify their, to uh, develop their own identity. But it, it took this disaster at Gallipoli, which today is sort of uh, uh, worshipped as a, as a shrine to Australian nationalism. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, you imagine America having this great celebration about Pearl Harbor, turn it into a national holiday and barbecues and commemorations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I noticed the passing of the Pearl Harbor uh, passing the other day, December 7th. President Trump didn't even say a word about Pearl Harbor. I mean, that's how mm. thick he is about world history. But, you know, you take a disaster and, and you turn it into a, a, an important moment in your history. I mean, what else can you do? All those people are dead and all you have is their memory. So you turn this memory into larger than life. The memory becomes very, very important. In fact, the memory is the only thing that justifies the loss of a life. You know, you, gotta, you have to remember things. And so I began this course for these young Australians who would then go on to work for NGOs and INGOs and IGOs all over the world. So I, I began with this historical experience. And we moved uh, uh, from there to the interwar period. And then uh, we moved into the Second World War, Cold War, 
and uh, the post Cold War era. And Australia has had um, has always identified with uh, Western values here. In the First World War, it was uh, the British Empire. Uh, Second World War was a great awakening for Australians. You now here they rely very deeply on the British Navy. And then uh, the British Empire goes to war with, with Hitler after the failure of appeasement in Europe. And, and Robert Menzies goes on the wireless and he simply tells Australia in about two sentences, uh, Britain is at war with Germany, we are at war with Germany, good night. I mean, that's the end of the discussion. There's no discussion in Parliament about a war declaration or any of that. And that this irritates a lot of older Australians today, that there's no discussion about war and peace. It is the decision taken by the leadership of the country with no consultation with anybody else except themselves, okay? And so he announces they're going to war. And so from 1939 uh, to 1941, uh, uh, Australia, once again, as part of the imperial trade-off, is providing uh, men and, uh, and armor or, uh, and, and munitions to... Uh, expeditionary forces to the Middle East and that kind of thing. So they're, they're assisting the British and fighting the Germans that way. And then in, uh, on December 7th, 1941, uh, everything changes. The Japanese, who had been neutral up to that point, and though they had joined the, uh, uh, the Axis powers in theory, uh, they attacked Pearl Harbor and Singapore and Hong Kong and all these places. And now Australia has got a war on its doorstep. And this great fear, I mean, here we have these Axis powers, uh, in fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, they all come together to uh, snuff out freedom. You know, that's really what they're talking about. They're talking about organizing the world according to their rules. And so there's Australia, once again, depending on the British Empire, uh, to be, uh, to prov- uh, the British, I'm sorry, the British Navy, to act as the buffer between them and Imperial Japan. Then, the, Simon, the damn thing happens. The, the two major ships that are sent to Singapore, Malaya, these places, Prince of Wales and the, uh, I forget the name of the second ship, I'll think about it in a minute. They're blown out of the water by the, the Japanese Air Force. And these, these, these ships, which are the symbol of the protection for Australia, the great equalizer, uh, and, and Australians don't know what to do. They're, they're kind of panicked. You know, I've got accounts I've published uh, from the American ambassador of the day to Franklin Roosevelt. Australians, he said, are panicking. They're racing from the sea- seaboard into the interior. Even the capital is in reach of the, the Japanese uh, Air Force, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, the, the, the British Empire is kind of disappearing. And then we, we, we have a little sort of unspoken history about the Singapore campaign. This is when uh, General Wavell surrendered to a numerically inferior group of Japanese forces. At that time, 6,000 Australians, newly trained from Rockhampton, deserted. That is, they took to the hills. They weren't, they weren't going to surrender. They knew too much about the Japanese and their bones to surrender. And uh, Churchill made a big deal about this in his war cabinet. He complained to Menzies, who I think was part of the war cabinet at this time, that it was the Australians who had contributed to the collapse of British forces in Singapore, which is the linchpin to the British Empire in that part of the world. And um, it was kept a secret for 50 years. And when the documents finally came out a couple of years ago, some, some guy in Britain wrote a beautiful book about why they deserted. And they deserted because they didn't believe the British anymore. And the British guy, you know, Wavell just said, let's surrender. and We'll be taken prisoners of war. And of course, the Japanese have a very different version of prisoners of war from other people, I suppose. And so they, they deserted. This is a great act of independence. I wrote about it once in the Australian, and it was actually censored. They said, oh, we can't remind people of this. They don't even know about it. This guy named Ephraim wrote this beautiful book about the, the greatest number of people in the history of the British Empire deserting at one time. When he says deserting, they just 
went the other way. They were not going to surrender. And so uh, that's a great moment. And, and, and Australia, the, the population is panicky. They don't know what to do. Uh, there are attacks in Broome. There are attacks in, uh, in, in some parts in Darwin. And the, the Japanese are closing in. And here in the great British Navy, uh, and has disappeared as a protection. Now, I know this because when I arrived in Australia in 73, I had students who grew up with the wireless and had fathers and mothers who had to deal with the, the possibility of a Japanese attack. I, I had one student, a true age student in 75, who said to me that his job in, in Queensland was to uh, kill his brothers and sisters if the Japanese were marching on the town because they knew it was, they, 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 they anticipated being enslaved, okay? Mm. And so this little youngster, this 14-year-old kid, is told to kill his brothers and sisters while his father held off the Japanese. There was an enormous fear. And the, the other thing, too, is the government of the day, and governments, you know, God bless them, they all do the same thing, and they lie. On January 23rd, 1942, it's a guy, uh, Royal, the head of the, uh, the armed forces, he informs the government of the day that there is no stopping a Japanese invasion. Australia, the road to Australia lay open. Now, this story was much contested in the 70s and 1970s and 80s, where a lot of people at Australian University said, oh, the Japanese are never coming. They didn't have 10 divisions to commit to Australia. Well, that's nonsense. The way to Australia lay open in January, and Guy Royals says to the, uh, uh, to the government, what shall we say? And the government says, say nothing. Tell people to remain in their homes. And, of course, this is a day where uh, most of Australia was prepared to give up everything north of the Brisbane line. This is the famous Brisbane line. They were going to concede everything to the Japanese. So uh, Australia is panicking. Now, keep in mind the population. In 1914, got a population of 4.92 million. In 19... 19- 41, 42. The population of Australia is 11.8 million people. And their best fighting forces are in the Middle East, fighting at two broken places like that. Or as Chifty says in one of his, uh, his messages to somebody, he said, you know, we've got 270 fighter planes in, in Britain and not one over Australian skies right now. So Australians are very much in despair. On the other hand, the they, they, they did have a little bit of hope that now that the Americans were drawn into the war and had the same enemies as the British Empire, that they might count on the Americans. So you've got this famous line by Chifley uh, on, in, I think, New Year's Day, 1942. We, we looked to the Americans uh, for support, you know, despite our colonial past and all this kind of stuff. So he, he sort of looking in that direction. This is very important. You know, when, when people start making these utterances, they actually reflect what's going on deep in their brains. The feet are moving in a different direction. The British Empire, as the ultimate guarantor of Australian sovereignty, is, is gone. It's not there. It is mainly manifested or translated through the British Navy, and the British Navy has been sunk. Now, let me get back to that story about those ships. The Prince of Wales and the Repulse were the two ships that were sunk off of Malaya. And I, I got this story from um, uh, some famous Australian admiral, Guy Griffith, who told me the story. He came to visit me once in my office in Queensland. Gosh, you know, when I was in Queensland, I had a lot of great visitors come to my office. In Victoria, I don't have anybody come to my office. But uh, anyway, <laughs> we, we, we're going we're gonna to have as a host guy named Arthur Martyr from the University of California University, who's just written a multiple uh, history of the British Navy in the Second World War. Mm. And I, I was chosen to organize a public lecture. You know, uh, public lectures usually get about 20 staff members and 15 homeless people, and that's it. <laughs> so <laughs> I organized a room for Arthur Martyr. And it was called, What Happened to the Prince of Wales and the Repulse? So I, I set up a, a, a public lecture. A thousand people showed up, Simon. A thousand people who had waited 
for news of the repulse and the Prince of Wales. This was a generation that was traumatized by the destruction of those ships. Traumatized. Wow. And um, they wanted to know the story. And he told them a very interesting yarn. He said to them that the Prince of Wales and the repulse could have escaped a Japanese attack. They could have just taken off. But there were 400 years of British naval tradition which mandated that the captains go down with the ship in the face of force majeure, okay? And so these people, these are just ordinary Australians that are Queenslanders, were hearing for the first time ships never had a chance and they, they, the captains went down with the ships. And I looked at that audience and I thought to myself, Wow, now here is, here is a story. I think it's very important. And I used to say to my students at Queensland, talk to your grandparents and your parents about the Second World before they go. Now, you got to understand this fear. So Australia enters the First World War with its great and powerful friend, Great Britain. By 1942, Great Britain is no longer there. By 1945, Great Britain is broke and <laughs> bankrupt. It's just bankrupt. It ain't going to be doing much for anybody. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they start to gravitate now towards the United States. And after the Second World War, the United States, which has always had a global presence in the Pacific, is taking a larger role. And Australia wants to formalize its relationship with the Yanks. Now, look, Australia and America are natural allies. But... And, you know, they got the same values and this kind of thing. And, but any relationship between them would be asymmetrical. America's much larger. The armed forces are much larger. The economy is much larger. Australia would be, you know, the smaller nation involved. And now we get into what do smaller nations do in a time of crisis? Australia is now in, in the late 40s and the early 50s looking for Another guarantee. They're looking for someone to guarantee their sovereignty, their future. Mm. So they, they drift towards the United States. And then you got this ANZUS Treaty. Now, I've got to tell you, while well, ANZUS Treaty, people just say every year in the Lowy Report, you know, 73, 78 percent of people believe in the ANZUS Treaty. If you ask Americans in St. Louis or Cleveland or Chicago or New York or Los Angeles what the ANZUS Treaty is, Simon, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. They would think it's a marsupial somewhere in the Brooklyn Zoo. <laughs> they wouldn't know what the ANZUS Treaty is. Now, the idea that Americans understand, uh, Americans have a very sketchy view of Australians. You know, Australians are what uh, some guy once said, scratches on the mind. <laughs> they don't know. What they <laughs> but, you know, Australia has, has, has had uh, uh, some ambassadors over there. Uh, Casey went over there in the 40s and he, um, he started spending money on, on publicity. He started getting Americans interested in wallpaper with, uh, with kangaroos on it. He, uh, he started getting his new friend. He had a new friend called Gallup. And he got Gallup to ask a question about Australia, which is always more important than the answer. And so he's trying to uh, publicize Australia. So now you've got a nation of about 7 million people in the Southwest Pacific, and it becomes... Uh, well, what it's always been, it's a great aircraft carrier. That's just sitting here waiting for the next uh, wave of attacks. And uh, mm. during the war itself, uh, General Douglas MacArthur was ordered to leave uh, the Philippines while his subordinate took the surrender from the Japanese and they overwhelmed the place. And he, uh, he went to Melbourne first. We got a rousing welcome. And he told the uh, Melbourne public when he got off the train that he remembers the Australian digger in the First World War and what a but a famous soldier he was. He says, I'm proud to be among you. Then he goes up to Queensland, and then he makes his way back to the Philippines, and then he makes his way to Japan, all the rest of it. So we, we've got that kind of personal touch. So MacArthur uh, comes along, and so Australians can identify with this particular personality. He looks like an all right guy, although he's an egomaniac by any stretch of the imagination. And so uh, they, they, they move in this direction, and then... Now, that, now they want a, a treaty. Uh, Australians uh, like treaties. <laughs> it's a, I, I've written standard 
definition or entry about treaties in some Oxford dictionary. And, and a treaty is like a convention or anything else. It just formalizes something. Sometimes you don't even need a treaty. I mean, does Israel need a treaty with the United States for people to know that America go to Israel's aid? No, they don't need one. But in Australia, they wanted some kind of treaty. So you got this, uh, they, they sitting down and they want this ANZUS treaty. Now, uh, the Labor Party and the Liberal Party both agree that there should be something. But the American Department of Defense is not really interested in a treaty. It doesn't want Australians to take American material or even ideas. You know, they're, they're not that interested. And so uh, this treaty, which is negotiated in Melbourne again, is negotiated by um, a very famous guy, John Foster Dulles who goes on to become uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Secretary of State. He's a corporate lawyer, and at the end of this treaty, which is about, I don't know, 12 paragraphs, it's as vague as hell, I can assure you of that. And um, he, he says he doesn't, really doesn't know what it means. And then some scholars in the 70s and 80s argue that the Anzus Treaty has no gravitas to it. And then... I always pointed out, well, Harry Truman pointed out that the Anzus Treaty looked and smelled just like the NATO Treaty. It had the same kinds of obligations, etc. It's very important for a number of Australian critics of America to point out in the 70s and 80s that the treaty doesn't mean much, that America will do its own thing. And I always disagreed with that. I thought the treaty was uh, pretty important. And, and America, when it doesn't like a treaty, it backs out of it. It did in 1800. Uh, it did later with the Vietnamese. It did later with the Taiwanese. You know, if you don't like a treaty, you're, you're obliged to abrogate it with a one-year notice, et cetera. Anyway, you get this Anzus Treaty, the Australian-New Zealand U.S. Security Treaty, and it's not exactly what what the, the Australia wanted, and it wasn't exactly what the Americans wanted, but it was what they could agree on. So it's a little vague. It talks about the threats in the Pacific and um, and then touching base with their um, uh, congressional authority or whatever it is. And one time in the 80s when I was really um, mischievous, I, I wrote an editorial across Australia saying that the, the Anzus Treaty only talks about the Pacific, doesn't talk about the Indian Ocean. <laughs> Comes out in the morning, in the afternoon, some guy says to me, turn on your radio. This is when they used to broadcast Parliament. And there was Andrew Peacock arguing that this guy, Syracuse, if didn't pronounce my name correctly, has got this all wrong, that the Andes Treaty refers both to the Pacific and to the Indian Ocean. Of course it does not refer to the Indian Ocean. It refers to the Pacific. In those <laughs> days, it would have been a very unusual thing. Anyway, uh, he, he's got to defend something um, which, which should have been obvious, that if you're attacked, you're attacked. It doesn't make a difference where you are. So anyway, I was having a little bit of fun. And I love the reaction. Peacock just went, you know, it went over the top with this thing. So the Anzus Treaty uh, becomes the, the the security, the cornerstone of Australian foreign policy. But before it was signed, the Australians did a very interesting thing. When the uh, the North Koreans attacked South Korea on June twentieth or whatever day it was in nineteen fifty two. The Australians were the first into the fight. You know, they got in there right away with the Americans and the other UN uh, uh, signatories who agreed to come to the aid of South Korea. And, and they, they made it very clear that they were prepared to pay what some fellow wrote about their insurance premium. Uh, it was usually called a very small insurance policy. Australia would kind of joined the conflict as a measure of good faith. And uh, that was considered uh, uh, very important. Of course, Australia was the first to join it because it's number A in the United Nations alphabetization of nations. But uh, Australia is this. And one of the people who helped craft that treaty, a a woman named uh, Bell, she told me that that treaty was 90% designed against the revival of imperial Japan and 10% against the threat from communist China, okay? 
So when Australia signed on to the ANZUS Treaty in 1952, it was 90% against the revival of the Japanese, 10% against the Chinese. And so by assisting the Americans in Korea, some people have said that the, the, the godfather of the ANZUS Treaty is, real, is really Mao because the Chinese orchestrated the entire North Korean attack on South Korea. So Mao becomes kind of the, the invisible grandfather of the answer. It, it, it allowed this sort of pretext for Australia to sign up. Anyway, mm-hmm. Australians did sign up. And over the years, the ANZUS Treaty was called upon from uh, all the time as part of Australia's bona fides during the Cold War. Um, Australia, for example, was the only British Empire nation I joined the Vietnam War. The Brits were too smart for that one. Uh, Australia got involved, and uh, I found notes in Texas after an interview with, with Robert Menzies in the 60s. I found a note which I then publicized and got it written around Australia. That Menzies said to this uh, interviewer in, in Texas at the Lyndon Johnson Library, he said it was a decision he made within five minutes. He says the idea was to get into the war, not to get out of the war. He wanted to get in because it allowed America, Australia to fight uh, cheek by jaw with Australians uh, uh, in, in Vietnam up against, Imperial, uh, against China, in, in communist China. He said it was, it was the easiest decision he's ever made. Now, I heard an expression. When I got here in the 70s, I used to ask everybody, whether they're in the military or academics or government. In those days, I got to meet everybody. In those days, for some reason, everybody was incredibly accessible. So I asked a general, I asked all these people, well, why did you get involved in Vietnam? What are the lessons of Vietnam? Why did you get involved in Vietnam? And this general told me something today, which is really relevant. He said to me, we got involved in Vietnam because we had an obligation as military leaders to bloody the next generation of Australian men. And so, you know, when you have this, this uh, report on the SAS about soldiers being asked to, uh, for their first kill, to bloody them, I thought, this, this goes way back. This guy told me it was to, to bloody this guy. Anyway, I asked John Gorton, who, uh, who was the prime minister for a minute, and I said, what, what are the lessons of Vietnam? And he said to me, well, the lesson of Vietnam is, uh, this is after America had left the war. He said, um, just don't go in with the Americans unless they go in with both boots. He thought Australia got uh, left behind because America decided to pull out before the Australian, uh, before mm. Australia could make the same decision. And so uh, I, I kept asking that question because you, then you start to get uh, how people calibrate the national interest. While the national interest was very important for American involvement in the war, Australia had its own version of national interest. And national interest was, it was part of the insurance policy to get involved with the Americans. And you stick with them. And so Australians have this very brave and enormous reputation. You know, you like to say, hey, and other uh, this is exactly right. And, and the same thing happened uh, on 9-11. Uh, John Howard is, is, in the, is in Washington. He sees uh, the smoke coming up from the Pentagon. He gets on the plane, goes back to Australia. And he makes a decision to uh, invoke the Anzus Treaty over the Pacific. That is to assist uh, the defense of America doesn't need defending, but he did anyway. And he did it ahead of uh, NATO. And I asked uh, Mr. Howard at a conference one night at, uh, in, at the Key in, in Sydney. He was in an interview with John Kelly. I said, did you know NATO had already invoked the alliance to assist the Americans? Because the only time the alliance, these alliances have ever been invoked. He said, no, he didn't know that. And then later on, I said to him, is it possible that you're you were a little traumatized. You know, you're under attack in Washington. You don't know where the next uh, plane is coming from. I said, is it possible that you, you might have done this too quickly or without much thought? And he thought about it. He said no. And then later on, he sort of retracted himself. Yeah, he said he might have been under a little bit of pressure to do that. So Australia has used this ANZUS treaty uh, as its uh, bona fide to sit at the head table with the United States. Now, when you say hitting above your weight, this is very interesting. When I, arrived, when I was going to go to Australia in 73, I got my telegram 
in November 72 that I'd been offered a post at the University of Cleveland, wherever the hell that was. Um, and so I walked around to these stores in New York looking for a book about Australia. And in 1972, I couldn't find a single book about Australia in, in the great New York bookstores, beginning with Crock and Bretano. What I did find Australia was in books about the British Commonwealth. There was always a chapter about Australia. It was always the same chapter. It was about you know, the economics. That Aust- the first sentence was always Australia was going to, because of its uh, uranium reserves, was going to be the Saudi Arabia of the 21st century. So Australia was always like this kind of uh, natural resource, et cetera. But there were no kind of there were no books about Australia available. Nothing like that. Absolutely nothing. Mm. And so Australia sort of looking for this definition with the Americans. And when I got here, I remember February 2nd, 1973, a very hot day. I'll also tell your, your, your listeners something else, too. I, the second book I bought in New York was a, a book called Speaking Strine, you know, Australian Habits and things like that. So my, <laughs> I got off the plane. In, when I got off the plane in Sydney and I got a taxi ride with my wife and kid to the Menzies Hotel, I gave the cab driver a $5 tip. Australian dollars. And Simon, he took that five dollars and he crunched it in his right hand and threw it in my face and said, Keep your money, I make a real wage. And I haven't <laughs> tipped anybody since nineteen seventy three. I learned something about the Australian <laughs> workers' pride, you know. <laughs> he just threw it in my face and I said, So much for that damn book. You know, I, I was just following the book, you know, <laughs> trying to be a, 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 a good person. Anyway. When I arrived, Australia was, when it was looked at academically by Annette Baker Fox and those at Columbia, and she'd write books about small powers. Australia was a small power. And I like small powers because I spent two years in Austria in 64, 65, and I got a perspective of how small power moves between the Soviet bloc and, uh, and Europe and the Americans. I'm always interested in how small powers survive. And this uh, goes back to my interest in antiquity. And one of the first books I, I read in high school was uh, Thucydides and the Peloponnesian Wars. And we, we were, my, my history master uh, put us in touch with the, the great yarn in that book about the Melian dialogue where the Athenian uh, admiral goes to the island of Milos, which apparently is supplying Sparta with uh, sucker, at least, if not material things. And he goes to these people, and he tells them to stop it. And they say, well, you think about it. And he says, no, no, you know, he says. He says, these are matters discussed by practical people. The standard of justice depends on the equality of power to compel, and that, in fact, that the strong do what they have the power to do, and the weak accept what they have to accept. And that's the lesson from antiquity. That's what real politics is is that you leverage whatever power that you have. And mm. nothing's changed in 2,500 years. Not human nature, not this concept. And smaller powers, whether they were part of the Delphian League, or I even heard the other day that when, 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 Ro- when Julius Caesar was in Gaul, that there were a number of Druids who were, or Celts who were fighting with, <laughs> fighting with the, the people in Gaul to, to keep the Romans down. You know, small powers always contribute they, they coalesce around larger powers who then can protect them. Yeah. So when I, I arrived, I just assumed Australia was a small power. And then one night at the University of Queensland at Story Hall, along comes Gough Whitlam, who had just been elected two months before I arrived. And he tells the audience about his foreign policy, which is pretty revolutionary, you know, uh, recognized China before the United States. He can do all kinds of things that angered people. He's going to recognize North Korea, this thing, that thing. And then he says, we must start thinking of Australia now as a middle power. So Australia got a promotion from small power to (laughs) to middle power in my first couple of years at Queensland. Now, this may sound funny, but you know, when you start to imagine you are a middle power, and today the Australian Armed Forces are 73,000 people, 25,000 at home, wear civilian uniforms and work in the Department of Defense. Australia has a very, very small force. It's lethal, but it's small. And so Australian, uh, Australian leaders always say that 
people that don't say because we're small, we hit above our waist. It's nice to say that because Australians are ensconced in the high command in the United States. You know, I interviewed, uh, well, I was in a, a, a briefing with Admiral Harris, and Australians had naval officers there who were uh, embedded in his force or embedded in his his leadership command, and they work in the United States and the Pentagon, and the Australians are everywhere, but there are not a lot of them. So how long can you go around telling people you're a middle power when, in fact, what you are is a first-class small power? Now, today, people would say, well, Australia is a middle power because it produces all this economic stuff, et cetera, et cetera. seems to me that middle powers are defined by what they've always been defined by, hard power. What is your ability to hit back at somebody? How do you project this kind of force? And so every time Australia does something good overseas or a military conflict, people talk about them hitting above their weight. Well, I tell you, my father was a prize fighter for 10 years. and He fought light heavyweight. He'd have fought the heavyweight division. He'd have been killed. You know, so as you get outside <laughs> your class, you're going to get killed no matter how good you are, as a matter of fact. So you know, here we have all these successive Australian foreign ministers talking about Australia as a middle power. And I remember when we were in conflict with Norway, there were some refugees. I think, I think Norway could have beaten us. I mean, you've got to be very careful about how you project yourself abroad. Anyway, to get back, that ANZUS Treaty became the uh, very small premium or when Australia coughed up troops in Vietnam, Gulf One, Gulf Two, and all the rest of it. This is the very small insurance policy, the premium on this major policy. And the major policy is a guarantor. Now, in recent years, Australia, America looks a little less reliable. And the complaints that President Trump has been making are the same complaints people made in the 60s about NATO not putting up enough money and then using their economic integration to compete with the United States. Um, uh, Australia is looking a little less reliable. And I, I, I think this recent trip that Scott Morrison took to Japan, where Japan is now committed to defending Australian troops and vice versa, <clears throat> is the beginning of the diplomatic revolution based on antiquity itself. That is, Australia is now looking for another great powerful friend because the United States might become unreliable. So people say that they argue, oh, Australia is very, America is very reliable. Well, not really. You know, when I was a kid, um, we left Vietnam, which fell two years later. Uh, we left in 73 and 75, it collapsed. Um, when I was a kid, CEDO and the Santo Treaty uh, Pacts disappeared. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, President uh, Carter informed his ambassador to Taiwan in the middle of the night to tell the Taiwanese that the security treaty no longer exists as America is now going to seat uh, communist China into the United Nations. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, we encouraged the Hungarians in 56 to rise up against the Soviet occupiers, and we did, and the Hungarians were slaughtered. Did the same thing in, in, in 1968. We encouraged the uh, Czechs to rise up against the Soviet occupiers, and they were slaughtered. There are a whole lot of instances where America just looked at its own interests and people were left in the lurch. You know, I think America uh, has, has adhered to treaty alliances more in the breach than in the adherence, okay? We've left a lot of people blown in the wind. Mm. And I think Australians, they can't admit this, you know, the, the story today is Australia has to choose between Beijing and Washington and Governments say, no, we don't really have to choose. Well, actually, you do have to choose. But if the Americans don't work out, and I think uh, uh, Morrison is sort of thinking with his feet here as he approaches the Japanese, and there's only two things that are going to help Australia in the future. It's got to have a very great and powerful friend. And I like the Japanese. And I, I've, I've interviewed and had breakfast with Japanese admirals. And Simon, they're not afraid of China. They're not afraid of North Korea. But the North Koreans and the Chinese are afraid of Japan. They're armed to the teeth in many, many ways that we don't even hear about. I think moving towards uh, more Chinese protection or Japanese protection, probably a pretty good idea. But look at the irony here. 90% of the ANZUS Treaty 
is designed to prevent the rise of Imperial Japan. And here we are, many, many years later, Australia is sidling up to Japan. Well, you know, it takes about four or five generations to change your mind nationally. And, and this is a very good move. The second way to protect yourself is the, is the taboo area, and that uh, nations that have nuclear weapons, no one messes with them, okay? You can't use them. They're expensive. They're dangerous. But it's also, uh, it's also your poster saying, go somewhere else. You know, so the, the nuclear powers today, no one's, no one's messing with them. And look at, and to prove my point, look at Saddam Hussein. He was always bluffing about his nuclear weapons, but because they thought he had them, and he did once in 1990, the urge of it, they crushed him. Same thing with Colonel Gaddafi. The South Africans got rid of their nuclear weapons because they didn't want to give them to the ANC. So very few nations give these things away, and if you don't have them, you're not really protect, protected against the great powers. So, mm. uh, you know, Australia's going to have to do something very creative in the future. Now, it's you know, I want to I, I want to I wanna dive ahead. into uh, yeah what you're sure. thinking will happen into you know into the future with Australia because you mentioned um, before the interview that um, you know something or possibly even in the interview actually uh, that uh, something we need to always consider is that you know we always think that okay Australia is always going to be around but it's going to change and things change and I think you make a really interesting point there about uh, this alliance with Japan because I you know I can even tell you that. Um, something that I knew growing up, uh, you know, my mom would always tell me about uh, her dad, who I, I never knew, um, my pop, but, uh, you know, he he was actually in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, you know, and his family would always say that, you know, he he never talked about it. He never talked about it because the stuff that went on there was so horrifying. And so, you know, it's, what's what's really interesting here is the very short, period of time in history in the in the you know in the view of in the entirety of history very short uh, that things change and now you know uh, uh, you know for the better hopefully we we are you know now building alliances with japan but i wanted to uh ask you something uh, tying it back to because I, I know you have a real interest and understanding of uh you know the importance of ancient history as well um, I don't know. I, I believe you've studied Heric- Heraclitus a, a bit as well. Um, yep. But uh, there's this quote that comes from Heraclitus, I believe, that I can't get off my mind while we're having this conversation. I have to ask you about it because uh, I think that you'd be in a really good position to answer this question that I've had for quite some time now. Uh, when you're talking about the modern history of, uh, of Australia, and even when you're just talking about the history of the world, I, I've noticed that you really focus on, uh, and this is probably because uh, these are the important moments in, in history, as well as the fact that you're a, a historian of diplomacy. So it's very important, but you focus heavily on the war. Um, you know, when we talk about modern history, we're talking about the wars that happen and who's on whose side and, and, and who's making treaties. Something that Heraclitus said was that war is the father of all. And when I think about that quote, it's really hard for me to grasp uh, sufficiently what he meant by that. War is the father of all. Uh, you know, if you have some sort of answer, what do you take away from, from that quote? Well, what he's saying, what I think he's saying is just that uh, war defines what's happened and what will happen in the future. I mean, war is sort of the, um, sort of the test cricket match on January 1st. <laughs> you can talk about things, but they have actually had a go at each other. And it's really about the, uh, the outcomes. You know, war is the, uh, oh, what is war? war? War is organized violence. That's all it is. And so when we have these asymmetrical wars in the 21st century, there's wars against terrorism and other people who don't have your, your, your clout. They come at you different ways. It's a little different. But I think that the wars define... The landscape. I'm interested, you're quite right, in diplomacy. I mean, there are only two uh, topics in the world. That is conflict and the attempt to stop the conflict. That's why I like war <laughs> and diplomacy. I mean, that's, uh, diplomacy is the only thing that keeps this contentious species of ours from killing each other. And uh-huh. uh, it is the only thing that's going to save Australia in the future is new thinking and innovative diplomacy. 
And I always tell my classes, and I've, told, I've had 45 years of classes, and they probably all think I'm sort of mad, and the mad guy. I always say to them, look, we, we need you to spend your lives thinking about innovative, innovative diplomacy and innovative ways to, to guarantee Australia's future. Uh, and then I point out to them, that there is no guarantee that Australia will go on. There is nothing carved in stone that says Australia ought to go on. And then I remind them that there are great civilizations that disappeared that, that were a lot smarter than we were. You know, they, they invented the goddamn wheel and things like that. I mean, there are people smarter than us who have disappeared from the face of the earth because we stopped thinking about it. I think about the Mayans, you know, who are, who are fighting with each other of uh, who, who goes first uh, in the royal, uh, in the, in, in the um, entourage while they're disappearing outside the door. I mean, Australia has to think very creatively, and but that's not happening right now because a lot of Australians are not studying history or antiquity or diplomacy. In fact, I'm very angry about the government's decision to make uh, the humanities and social sciences uh, an expensive degree along with law and other things. You know, this is depriving Australia of a generation of thinkers. I mean, we, we have to solve these problems. And we need people who are exposed to uh, ancient thinking because the ancients, you know, they may have done things differently. They may have had trouble tying up their shoelaces without shoes, but they had the same problems we did, and that is how to survive. And I want to add a footnote here about your, your grandfather. <laughs> Japanese did terrible things to Australians in World War II. And there was a military historian at Duntruna met years ago who did a book on Australia and the Japanese. He pointed out that Australia had the highest kill ratio of the Japanese in the Second World War. The, Jap the Australians killed 20 Japanese soldiers for every Japanese soldier who killed an Australian. So when I had a chance to ask Austra J Japanese visitors one day who'd served in World War II, I'd say to them, oh, why didn't you surrender more often? And he said to me, to whom? because they weren't taking any prisoners. So I've got to tell you that the, the, the Japanese image of the ferocity of the Australian soldier is as great as our fear of what happened in these camps. In other mm -hmm. words, it, it, is, it is a process. But mm -hmm. um, look, Heraclides is right that, that war determines the landscape and diplomacy determines how we get to that landscape. And mm -hmm. the only thing that keeps us from uh, uh, lapsing into war from time to time is, is creative diplomacy. I mean, how are we going to figure this out? And if uh, the Australian kids, and I'm very, very worried about Australian university kids, there is no, uh, there is no sense in Australian universities to work at the highest levels of government, unless you're a member of the Liberal Party, the Labor Party Club. I mean, the Australian government does not recruit these great minds. The intelligence and security communities do not uh, recruit these great minds. And the few that they do recruit are beat into submissions as a result of groupthink. They're not, mm -hmm. you know, they, they become the asterisk in these intelligence and security reports. So I, I, I'm very worried there's a disconnect between Australia's bright thinkers and, and uh, levels of government. When I see people in the Australian government, even in the American government, who claim to be the great expert on Ukraine or the great expert on this or that, and then you realize they have never written about it, they don't know anything about it, they're just faking it. They got the, they got the portfolio under the nose. That's what they're doing. Yeah. And so if you don't know anything about anything, now I always like to say to my students, Simon, be careful who you vote for because they can get you killed. Well, that's absolutely true today. You know, <laughs> the wrong person can get you killed. You know, if you vote for George W. Bush and he fakes all the intelligence about weapons of mass destruction, he can get you killed. Lyndon Johnson could get you killed. And Robert Menzies can get you killed in Vietnam. All kinds of people who then ask their citizens to, uh, to, to carry arms in pursuit of national interests or goals, which may have no bearing on reality. And mm -hmm. so what we got to do is we, we have to have a, a longer bow here. We have to think back historically. You know, what, what options did people have? What can small powers do? 
I mean, are we really a middle power? I mean, after this podcast, I'm going to get a hundred emails saying, what do you mean we're not a middle power? And well, we're not a middle power. We're a small power. You know, we're 26 million people, 73,000 people. Got a great little Air Force going on. Uh, it's very expensive Air Force, but the F-35s uh, arrive <laughs> in, in large numbers. And, and, and you know, it, it's small. And so Australia's diplomacy is going to have to be very creative. And then I find out that Australia's diplomatic footprint is, is getting less and less. Australia, I think, is ranked number, I don't know, 24 in the OECD in terms of what it spends on diplomacy. It doesn't spend a lot of money on diplomacy. And some of the people it sends around the world used to be great diplomats, by the way. But now they've adopted that very, very bad American habit of sending their buddies around the world. I'm not going to mention names, but you got high commissioners in Britain and you got ambassadors uh, in, 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 in Washington who are what? They're just good old boys. These are just political jobs, plum jobs, plum jobs in Geneva, plum jobs at the UN in New York. You, know, you got a whole bunch of people who ain't thought much about diplomacy or history or anything else. I mean, we, we had a guy, I won't mention his name, he's top, one of the top ambassadors in, in, uh, overseas and for, for Australia, and then I found out he got a second-class honors from some British university in history, and I thought, Christ, you know, <laughs> we got people out there who are dangerous. Not only do they not know anything, they're a good example of what not to hire. In other words, as soon as you're, you start to politicize these diplomatic appointments, which are really kind of the, the nodes or the, the important points to, to get information, to do things with, you, know, and you start to put them in there, put your friends in there, all kinds of weird things happen. It discourages the younger people from applying, discourages mm. anybody else. And Australian universities are not turning out, telling people, pointing people in this direction. You know, the life of a diplomat, the life of a, U, life of a UN person, or the life of someone working on population in China or Vietnam or North Korea. I mean, no one's turning out these, 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 these people who should be involved in the process. Anyway, my, my lesson to the students was, is that, uh, smarter people than we have, civilizations, in fact, have disappeared, whether they're the Egyptians or the Assyrians or, you know, the Romans or the, or the Greeks. I mean, people who were really thought about the world just disappeared from the face of the earth. And so what chance do we have? And the thing is, there is nothing natural about Australia. My first mentor in Australia was the famous Gordon Greenwood. One of the last God professors, um, you know, he, he had some drinking problems by the time I met him, but he had a great mind. And he said to me, the only connection between the United States and Australia is, is Australia became possible when the United States became colonies and threw the British out because the British needed a place to put their troublesome Irishmen. So Australia <laughs> starts out as a penal colony. Why? Because they can't send them to Georgia anymore. Mm. So he said, Australia is an accident. Historic. It shouldn't be here. It's in the Southwest Pacific with all these other multicultural nations and peoples and languages. And here you've got this little outpost of my, my, and, and back in the day, of mostly white, English-speaking people on the cusp of Asia. On the other hand, over 100 years, Australia developed a, a unique insight into Southeast Asia. In fact, General Eisenhower's people used to say the National Security Council, let Australia take the lead because they thought that Australia had a special connection to this part of the world. They understood it better than other people. But today we don't understand the Southeast better than other people. You know, we don't, we don't have that kind of mentality. We don't teach enough foreign languages in, in schools. We don't have enough people taking exotic courses. In, in short, we're sort of dumb and bound the next generation. And we're not sending them out there. How are they going to solve these problems? Anyway, Professor Greenwood's bottom line was, we're not going to make it because there's nothing natural. It's not about moving from the East Coast to the West Coast as you did in America, or the, the uh, thousand years that European nations are in place of tribes. He says Australia could disappear, and, and, and no one will know they're gone. He says because it, it was a historical accident. And it's very interesting. Gordon wrote the only book on this called Australia and the Americas in 1944 on that kind of wartime paper. There are only a couple, a few copies uh, extant. And when I was at UQ, <laughs> Prime Minister Gough Whitland was coming down the hallway in the old story, or in the old Fort Smith building, 
looking for Professor Greenwood. He wanted a copy of Gordon's book before he went to Latin America because it was the only book where an Australian scholar looked out at Australia's outlook in the Americas. Extraordinary. There hasn't been another book like that, by the way, mm-hmm. since 1944, because Australians don't think that way. In other words, I think we got a lot of problems ahead of us, but I think we have uh, unactualized brain capacity to solve these problems. And I think Australia can do it without selling their souls. Now, the key to Thucydides' passages is not that the powerful do what they want and the weak accept what they must. He talks about practical people. You know, and your whole podcast is about the practical Stoics. And he's saying that maybe we should ask ourselves in the years ahead, what is the practical outlook for Australia? What practical remedies are in front of us or solutions? I don't think we ask that question. You know, if Australia is just trying to tie up with the next great and powerful friend, it's quite obvious the British did it until they ran out of juice and the Americans will get tired and go home. Uh, and, and then, you know, now they're going to tie up with the Japanese, quite clearly to me. And there's no doubt in my mind that within five, set, ten years, Japanese will have uh, nuclear weapons. They're only a screwdriver away anyway, because they're not going to trust the Americans to provide that one thing America provides to 37 nations tonight. It has extended nuclear deterrence. And as America has committed its nuclear weapons force to defending the freedom of 37 nations around the world. Well, maybe they will and maybe they won't. You know, who knows at the end of the day? Because if everything depends on the, the mental set of the man or woman in the White House, if we have to play, uh, 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 we have to play bingo every four years to see who's on who's on the page, well, we're going to be in trouble. And this is the trouble with the polarization of American politics. It's just that Australians aren't able to sort of chart the course. So you got a lot of these institutes in Australia saying, "Oh, Chinese." are the great power we have to worry about. Well, actually, China is not a rising power. It is a declining communist party. When I was a student in, Vietnam, in, in Vienna, I studied comparative communist systems for two years, 18 months. And I found out that by the fourth or fifth generation of communist parties, that there is uh, no enthusiasm for the original motives. And the Chinese went crazy in 1991 trying to understand why the Soviet Union and the Soviet Communist Party closed shop at the end of 74 years. Right now, the Communist Party is in panic mode, which is why they're so disagreeable, because they think there's a counter-revolution coming. coming. That's why they came down on those kids in Hong Kong, and they're going to try to come down in Taiwan. They don't want to set up an alternate model out there. And they don't want to see some counter-revolution coming. The Communist Party is panicked that they're going the way of the Soviet Union, which they identified as the causes of corruption and bureaucracy, which isn't exactly it at all. Soviet Union ended because by the time of the fifth generation, they didn't see the point. And so the Chinese communists today are not acting from strength, but fear. And every time an Australian politician says, we have to deal with this rising China, we've got to buy all these... Uh, F-35s for the year 2030, and all these submarines for the years of 2040 to deal with the Chinese. But by that time, the Chinese Communist Party will have dissolved. They'll have been replaced by other people. China will still be important. A lot of the Chinese communists will become great nationalists, as they are at the end of the Cold War in Europe. But I think the Chinese Communist Party is declining and fearful and very dangerous right now. It's not a rising power. It's a declining communist power. And the reason people here don't know this is because they don't study comparative communist systems. They don't study anything about communism. You know, you can go through a history degree here and study anything but the former Soviet Union or the rise of China or anything like that. They don't understand that a good communist thinks like a good communist. They never change their mind. The dialectic is always the dialectic. We don't understand how these people think. Once again, I'm getting back to we, we can't ask our young people to deal with these things if they don't study these things at university or someplace else. Mm. They don't have the equipment. So whereas Australia sometimes wants to play an important role, if it doesn't have the personnel, it doesn't have the young people who want to devote their lives to understanding how the Chinese or anybody else's mind works, we're sort of condemned. And the thing is that people think they can put it off and put it off. You know, manana. The old song from the 40s, manana is good enough today. Well, tomorrow is not good enough. Australians are going to have to think about their future 
Well, frankly, Simon, they're not going to have one. Mm. You know, th- this is a really important conversation and, uh, you know, particularly for me because it, it, it is, uh, we're talking about things that I've been really, uh, that have been kind of waking me up recently. You know, I think that a lot of these conversations that we have um, and a lot of the conversations that I have on the podcast, that, that's kind of the way I see it. It's like, hey, Simon, wake up, wake up, you know, learn about history, learn about philosophy, learn about making good, deci- uh, good decisions. Because at the end of the day, it's only a matter of time uh, before the people who are in power making these decisions now are going to be out of power. And who are the people who are going to take over and be making the wisest possible decisions for our nations, for, you know, for our people. And at the end of the day, um, what, what I find really interesting about the time that we're living in is we're in that interesting point. It seems in, in societies where things are generally really good. <laughs> like if you look at the span of history, things are really good for Australians right now. Um, comparative to history, things are really good in Western culture in general. Um, and so priorities are shifting, you know, and, and I'll give you an example, something that really freaks me out <laughs> um, uh, or at least makes me think I need to get my priorities straight is, you know, the other day I was kind of Googling what kind of careers um, are on offer for somebody who say gets a, a doctorate of philosophy at the moment. Um, and you'd think, okay, cool, philosophy, uh, there's got to be some really meaningful things out there that, um, that you might head into if you had a doctorate of philosophy. Uh, the main career that I saw that is like growing by 20% every year or something like that, uh, something insane like that, is as a data analyst for marketing. You know, so we have our brightest minds now, uh, our smartest people heading into careers like, uh, you know, at Facebook or you know, Twitter or TikTok, uh, analyzing how they can make the company the most amount of money uh, by getting people to pay as much or attention to these apps as possible. Um, and that's the sort of thing that, um, and look, if anybody's listening and that's your job, all power to you, that's fine. I don't care. But, <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to make is priorities are shifting. Uh, who are the people who are going to be uh, making wise decisions in the future? Where are our priorities now? And, and, and where are we spending our attention um, in, in the global uh, and, the, and the national landscape? So, you know, what do you think about the priorities that we have now? Where is our attention shifting? And what do you think are going to be the major challenges for somewhere like um, Australia uh, in terms of utilizing uh, the brain power that we, that we know we have, even though we might not use it to the best of our abilities. Well, what does Einstein say that we, uh, we only use about 1% of our brain power. I, mm. I'd say that um, in the Australian context, we only use about 5% of what we could do. Uh, that is about 95% of unactualized power. Mm. I see these ads on television, you know, they're telling people, look, um, Get these jobs tomorrow, plumbers and electricians. God knows we need them all. But now they're telling people to go into these service jobs. And, and universities are now being cued by what the business people say. I tried to give courses at RMIT, and they said, oh, what do are, what are the businessmen say? Is there, is there a need for this? I couldn't give a fig about what the business community thinks. I'm thinking about the large picture, whether we're here or not. Australia needs to retain these people, and you know they're going to have to open their hearts and wallets to getting all these kids in country Vic, and and same thing in, in New South Wales countryside. All these re- regional kids, we got we got to start using the best brains in the country. We 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 have never brought the best brains in because they're too busy cashing the checks from these Chinese kids or trying to get an Australian experience or the Indian kids. You know they uh, this. Uh, Foreign students were our third largest export, $38 billion. Why should Australian universities care about all the brain power in the country or in the regional areas we have when they could be cashing all these checks? And so we're going to have to start rethinking about what a university is and who gets to go to it. And I'm telling you, when these politicians started to put um, humanities and social sciences out of range of the ordinary student to make them sort of... uh, special degrees. You know, we're going back to the 1920s where only 
Rich kids can study Socrates. Only rich kids can study diplomacy. Only rich kids can study philosophy. I mean, we're going back to that white shoe brigade, which is pretty scary, as a matter of fact. Mm. And so we got all this unactualized potential, and we got all these people who are trying to exclude uh, Australians from higher ed. I feel very strongly that Australia can have a, a free uh, university system for all of its people, the way uh, West Germany did and France does and all the rest of it. We've we got to bring these people into the system because at the end of the day, uh, it, 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 I, I think we have an obligation for one generation to pay for the next generation if we're going to survive at all. So they're going to have to get a bigger concept about what they should be looking at. But you're right. Uh, you know, hiding people off into IT and, you know, a whole lot of things I don't want to mention because they're all good people. But the idea that we, that we, we don't need thinkers. I mean, look, look at, you know, the, the fight in this country to introduce the great books. The great books was a great idea to bring them into university. Yeah. Uh, a guy named Adler uh, did this in, in Chicago in the 1920s. Today, if you want to bring the great books ideas into the university, the classics, and the, you know, it becomes a political issue. You know, it's just Tony Abbott's mob. And, you know, most universities don't want these kinds of political interference, et cetera. So students are not only de- uh, denied access to these degrees, which open the world to them, but they're even denied access to the great books because they become politicized. We're going to have to rethink this. You know, yeah. Australia's greatest wealth is its young people, and they're treated very badly. You know, they're treated very badly. It's okay. They're unemployed. You know, we'll get them some work at uh, McDonald's or the casino counting cards or, or you know, we, we can get them into this. You've got a lot of great minds out there who are dying to, to study and learn and to open the world for Australia. Uh, and, and we're closing the world. The Australian higher education experience is getting smaller and smaller. I think uh, uh, this COVID-19 and the short-sightedness of universities have actually uh, uh, caused universities to sort of fall over for the next 20 years. I say 20 years to recover the, the, the human capital from the thousands of people they have dismissed as being too expensive. This is crazy stuff. Australia can't afford to lose anybody with a brain. You know, there's not that much of it around. And when I see these people at the top, the ministers for education, I don't care what party they're from. When I see the ministers for this and that, I don't care what party from the front. And they're all uh, talking from the same hymn book that uh, universities get too much money, they get too much of this and too much of that, and they punish them all the time. So Australians are going to have to think a lot about the one thing they have. What they got is a lot of young people who want to make a contribution, but they have to be guided by a generation of, of uh, scholars and, and other people who can point them in the right direction. And, mm-hmm. and it's not happening. And so I see a very dim future for Australia. I think Australia will become kind of a, maybe a Japanese zip code one day. I don't know. Just uh, I don't <laughs> see Australia having a big, a big future because, you know, there's a great line. There's a great line. Uh, one time, uh, Henry Kissinger was talking to the Turkish foreign minister who was complaining to uh, Kissinger about this or that. And Kissinger says to the Turkish guy, he said, don't imagine I go to bed each night thinking more about your future than mine. And the idea that I think Australians right now think somebody else is going to solve their future. But, you know, they ain't going to solve it. I mean, Australia's going to have to help themselves. And I don't know how long we can play the game. But I think if we uh, actualize our resources, our human resources, and we, we make things available to people uh, to uh, create a world around them, uh, I think we've got a fighting chance. We can hold it off for a while. Australia has an important role to play. Mm-hmm. But the idea that we're going to go on without ideas, the idea that we're going to go on without our own human capital, the idea that we can exploit foreign students to maintain and prop up our universities to uh, spend money in all kinds of crap. You know, that's over. We, we're going to have to rethink who runs these universities. You know, what bothers me in the 45 years I've been here, when I started, universities were run by public intellectuals. Today, they're run by lovely people who have been identified by corporate headhunters as good businessmen and women. What do they know about university? Zero. 
Mm. And they're going to drive it into the ground because the tops of organizations hire in their own image and likeness. And I keep thinking of all those great armies that have disappeared and all those generations that died for nothing because the people at the top had no idea what they were doing. And the idea, people think that the people at the top can get you in trouble, may, may not be able to get you in trouble. But I'll tell you what, people at the top, if they are stupid, can do incredible damage, not only in the short term, but in the long term. You know, we have to realize you've got to hold people accountable. My God, in this country, we, we hold rugby coaches more accountable than we do governments. Hmm. <laughs> governments do this in terrible damage. And when I see everybody pounding the universities and get too much of this, I once asked a, a guy in the Labor Party I much admire, I said, why wasn't the Labor Party nicer to universities? He said, well, you know, vice chances would ask for money, and then we'd watch buildings go up on their campuses. He said, how can you get money to people who are putting it all into capital works? They're not putting any money into students or libraries. And you know, he's absolutely right. All these vice chances are building these pyramids or these monuments to their memories. Mm. <laughs> We're forgetting what, what the purpose uh, of a university education which was the obligation of one generation for the next to prepare them for the world. And so we're not preparing people for the next world. And people, you know, who, who are not prepared to deal with the future and the challenges of the future, and they are all around us, uh, puts us in a very perilous position. So I, 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 I work with anybody who, who wants to reach out to the world and try to figure out something, because if we don't solve poverty. We don't solve climate change. We don't solve nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, we're, we're not going to make it, you know. There's a wonderful uh, image in DiCaprio's got this wonderful uh, documentary on climate change. And uh, he, in the last frame of the documentary, you got these trees and rivers and mountains. And he says, you know, in the end, everything will be perfect again. And then he says, but we won't be here. <laughs> I'm thinking, that's <laughs> right. Australia will be this wonderful land, but we won't be here. Somebody else will be here. And, and, and so uh, I, 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 I do not appreciate being Australia's Jeremiah. I don't want to be the voice of doom because, you know, I've produced too many students who have hope. But uh, I, I do despair of governments understanding what the purpose of a university education is, the purpose of history and philosophy and social sciences. I mean, connecting with the world. Now, every time I go to India or I just did a thing with Bangladesh, these people say to me, you know, we're so happy to have you here. And, you say, and I say, why? <laughs> what are they doing with me? And they say, we value expert knowledge. They venerate knowledge, expert knowledge. Have you ever heard anybody like that in this country talk like that, that they, they venerate <laughs> knowledge, expert knowledge? They, they dump on knowledge, okay? I've seen major thinkers dismissed. And, and, and it's because they don't know the difference. And look, it's, it's not their fault. You know, if you get your, your rise in the political world via this or that, and you have no idea what, uh, of, of your human capital, your social capital that you're wasting. You're sitting on a gold mine mm. with all these bright young people for whom there is no future. And that's why yeah. I'm very angry at this COVID-19. The governments should have doubled down here and said, look, students, don't worry about those damn debts. And we're going to have more of you. And we don't need all those foreign students here because we're going to try to pick up the slack with all those people in the regional areas that we don't seem much to care about. I mean, Australia is sitting on a gold mine of, of intelligence. And when I think of when I, I, I work with the History Council of Victoria, I go out to the country and I give university style lectures and I see these really bright valedictorians in these strange little towns whose names I could barely pronounce. And they're smart as hell. And they think about the big cities in Australia. That's kind of the dark side of the moon. They don't know how to get here. They don't know if anyone's interested in them. I'm interested in them. And so every time I come back in the country, I always say to these vice chancellors, hey, look, we've got a lot of people out there who deserve to study in major universities and to, to mix it up with other people. They don't understand that the greatest asset, not some unrealized dollar in some, some Asian higher education market, the greatest asset they own 
Simon, it's under their feet. It's right here. They're looking right at it. But because of the lack of history, because of the lack of perspective, because of that business instinct that they all have to turn out a profit, they don't see that the great treasure is right in front of them. So at the end of the mm-hmm. day, um, it would be, again, let's go back to the Greeks. What's happening right now is a tragedy. What is a tragedy? A tragedy is a terrible unfolding that everybody can see. Today, we call it the gray rhino in the business world. You know, the gray rhino is the, the great event that everybody sees, but nobody does anything about. Mm. Uh, and that's because people who in the business world don't know anything about Greek tragedy. Or they call it, we got a tragedy in front of us. And, and, mm. and nobody's doing anything about it except people like you who are talking to people like me. But we don't have any power at the end of the day. But, mm. you know, I think at the end of the day, people know in their bones they're moving in the wrong direction. Okay, and I know when that water rises, and the, and these lowlands flood around the world, the rich people are going to go up to the hill. And they're not going to worry about anybody else. And in this COVID, I'm sure the rich people and all the other people who have a chance to get vaccines first will get their vaccines first. Hmm. You know, at the end of the day, we've gone from the wonderful social gospel of the middle of the 20th century back to uh, survival of the fittest. And without bringing in all these bright, humane young people, that's exactly the direction we're headed in. We're going back to uh, Darwinist um, uh, evolution that is the the survival of the strongest. Mm. And it doesn't work that way. So anyway, I I think uh, Australia has an important place to play in the world. I think it's slightly oversized right now. That is, we keep telling people we're middle power, but we act like a small power. I mean, well, look, look at Australia. Australia gives less than foreign aid in the U.N. than anybody else. I mean, peanuts. Mm. You know, we spend more on dog food and cat food than we do on aid to other people. <laughs> and, you know, and we're, we're looking in the wrong direction. We're becoming very selfish. And so what we have to do is get all the, and the young people are wonderful. They've got that wonderful idealism that only comes with youth. But the trouble is they have to deal with people at the top. Who well, that's kind of an inbuilt cynicism going on. I don't want to raise <laughs> They have no, nothing to do with the original cynics, but they, they, they're not very hopeful. And mm. so everybody at the top is sort of covering their asses while we allow Australia's great assets to just disappear. That is, if, we don't, if you don't ask people to join society in solving the great problems, they're just going to get tired and walk away. And mm. who can blame them? And, you know, I just, I want to underscore, so firstly, you know, I appreciate the compliment earlier of saying that we're doing something here, but I don't want to pretend for a second, like I, you know, like I'm doing anywhere near what I could be doing, you know, to prepare myself for, uh, you know, the, the world to come. But, um, but, you know, I think that it took me a long time to start actually paying attention to say uh, history, philosophy, um, you know, culture, especially as well, has, has taken me a long time, even though I did a degree in, in music, it's only really this year that I've started to actually uh, it broaden my cultural horizons. But the, the more that I study this stuff, the more that I think about it, the more that I um, be, you know, get around it and, and exposed to people such as yourself, uh, there's a few things that happen. You know, firstly, yeah, it does horrify you. Like history do- should horrify you because it's, it's rough. <laughs> it's really rough for 99% of the time, uh, but it should also empower you and make you realize that, you know, every single one of your ancestors got through all this and they, you know, they, they made the best of it. They did the best that they could. And, and so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, this kind of liberal arts education that you say is, is kind of on the way out, uh, you know, around history, philosophy, it's so necessary because, you know, it it wakes you up and it makes you realize that uh, things are important and you do have a role to play in your society. And it's very important that you do actually play that role because when you don't play that role, then the chances are that your neighbor's not going to play that role and then their neighbor's not going to play that role. And eventually uh, that's how things degrade. So, you know, I think there are wise words from you to, to at least pay attention to uh, the ways that we could, I think it's pay attention to the ways that we can become citizens as opposed to consumers, um, citizens of our country and, and, and 
try to aim at the best, um, whatever that is, and to the extent that we can define what the best would be. Um, so yeah, you know, Joe, I appreciate you being on the show today. This is this has been a great conversation, and uh, and we are wiser for it. Well, look, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your your people listening to this. Look, uh, I, I'm not the Lone Ranger here. I don't have anything original to say. What I'm saying is things that other people should be saying too, and maybe they yeah. want to say these things, but they don't have the vehicles the way you you provide. But I know a lot of people are thinking about these things. And um, now one time I, I gave a speech at a, an ALP thing in, in Brisbane, and this coal miner who grew up in Wales comes up to me and he said, you know, I, I really appreciate what you're saying because you, you stretch my mind. We have to stretch people's minds yeah. a little bit. And, you know, and they, but it, the, the thing that when I went to Europe the first time in 1964, I'm just looking at the Roman ruins on my way to Vienna, thinking to myself, what the hell happened to these people? <laughs> Where are they? And then when I got to Germany for a minute, how could these nice people have created concentration camps? Where did they go wrong? You know, and history tells us how people take the wrong road. And it's easy to take the wrong road. It's seductive. It's attractive. And maybe it's just a lazy thing to do. So if Australia disappears because it's lazy, then it's disappeared for the wrong reasons, because Australia is not lazy. Australia is a very brave, courageous place. You know, I've said before that if 100 people are walking by a, by a, spool, a pool in Australia where someone's drowning, all 100 will jump in and save someone's life. Hmm. But, you know, if there's somebody in need or there's a great idea out there, they avoid it. And I don't know why. I mean, uh, D.H. Lawrence tries to say in Kangaroo in 1912 that, Australians have a, an uh, anti-intellectual disposition. That is, they don't want to pursue ideas. And maybe there's something wrong with it. Or maybe it's uh, not practical in 1912 when you're trying to make a living or something like that. But there's just something about this place that um, diminishes the role of ideas. And so we've got to bring it to front and center. Because as soon as you understand ideas, as soon as you understand why Socrates, created, I mean, well, what he meant when about the life of the mind. He used to say to politicians, Simon, he said, how do you hire people? You know, they used to ask me in those days. I say, never hire anybody who doesn't know why Socrates had to die. So that became the standard question you know, among a number of leading politicians when they hired staff. Why did Socrates have to die? Hmm. Well, he died because he introduced false gods, he corrupted youth. And at the end of the day, he was just a smart ass. But the point is, <laughs> at least they had a reference to people who had to deal with the same kinds of things. You know, you need to have references. And if you ha your world has no history in it, it's, it's ahistorical. If you start to imagine uh, that there's nothing to be learned, you are like the U.S. Army manual used to say. Animals learn from their own mistakes, and people learn from the mistakes of others. At the end of the day, we're no better than animals. We'll just invent the wheel and learn from our mistakes every week and then repeat them again. Yeah. And we do not have the time or the luxury to do that, because in terms of the great clocks, Australia is running out of time. Because unless it forges its own future, it's going to be dragged along in somebody else's wake, whether they like it or not. And so we're going to wind up as somebody's overseas zip code i see that clearly unless we do something about it yeah i tell you what the uh the takeaway for me for the for the whole episode you just said it never hire somebody unless they know uh why socrates had to die that's that's an important piece of wisdom right there um that's a that's a reflection of your soul <laughs> your answer to that well question. well, well that, that's exactly right i mean uh, i meant it in a real sense that if someone yeah. did not have a sense of Politics. I mean, politics uh, uh, is a struggle for power. And, 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 and Socrates knew when he was defeated. And, and he, he, he took the, the noble way out for him. And then we find out later on that only noble people can commit suicide. Everybody else had the con their property confiscated, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, unless people have a sense of history, they have no history. And, and mm -hmm. people without, a, without any history are very dangerous because they make the same mistakes over and over again. And, and then when they, they tell you, not lies, 
but they tell you things that are not true. They really think they're true, but they're not true. We've been down that road. Um, and, you know, to think that a nation of uh, a country of 12,500 miles, you know, with 30 surface ships and a couple submarines can defend itself without great ideas is suicide, national suicide. And so we have a great obligation if this little dream is to go on. And Professor Greenwood is right. Unless we have solutions to the future, we're not going to be part of the future. And um, I think he also said in a more succinct way, people who don't think about their future don't deserve one. Mm. Wise words. Wise words to end the interview. I appreciate your time, Joe, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to having you back soon. Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.